very, very good afternoon to all of our viewers joining us today. We do apologise for those pesky gremlins in Australia, we would say. They are flaming mongrels. My name is Patrick. Joining me on camera is Craig. And of course, as always, please do communicate with us using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or the YouTube chat stream. If you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear them. So it is Safari Live's episode 56 and the last Safari Lives, which uh, I'm sure Lauren will agree with me when I say that we're pretty gutted about it. Both Lauren and I really love Monday nights. We love Safari Lives. It's short, sharp and shiny. And we get to catch up on all the cool things that happened during the week. And of course, with Safari Lives, we are always trying to look for our characters, which is exactly what I'm doing. But it's been pretty, pretty quiet this afternoon. There's a lot happening off Juma, off the property today, unfortunately. And so there's not much going on. I know that Tandy has been seen around south, but Lauren's going to go down and check that out. And as for me, well, I'm just patrolling around the northern area at the moment. I'm currently at Buffles Hook Dam, but I'm just picking up for any signs. I know Tingana is often seen up this side. And as for the Avoca male, well, he seems to have left his zebra kill, but we did see him last week. No, sorry, the Kudu kill, but we did see him on a zebra kill last week. Let's go and have a look at that one. After coming across a zebra carcass, many wondered if it was the unfortunate zebra with a bad limp. The Inkahumas and Avokas made short of the carcass, and the Avoca licked his paws in satisfaction. He too still has a bad limp, but unfortunately can't swap stories with the zebra about it. So it was very, very cool to actually catch up with the Avoca male so much last week, obviously because of that heavy limp that he has. He wasn't overly mobile up until yesterday when he was highly, highly mobile. He did a lot of traversing across the property, then ended up down in Chitwa Chitwa, and then dragged the... It wasn't the carcass that you just saw, the zebra carcass. It was actually a kudu carcass that he dragged very far down into a riverbed. A riverbed which I, after the TV show, marshmallowed myself in. So <laughs> I held the crown up in the Mara and now I hold the crown in Juma of the Marshmallow King. Thankfully, Conradi and and Marcel came and helped me out and it just ended up, I just had to gut it, gun it out of there. Now, someone who would never admit that he marshmallows, but probably does quite a bit, is Mr. James Henry up in the Mara. Let's go see the host with the most. I certainly do get marshmallowed quite a lot, but I've been very clever at avoiding doing it live. Patrick, that is the trick to marshmallow incognito. Now, we have a big lap, map lamp. We have a big map over here. We've shown you this map many times before, but I thought what we'd do is go through the movement of the migration. We've got lots and lots of questions about when is the migration, you know, kind of when is, as, as if it, it occurs and then stops occurring. But in actual fact, of course, it occurs all year round. So, We'll begin in January, because that is, of course, the beginning of the year. And in January, if they're just before the wildebeest cows are ready to give birth, they're arriving here on the short grass plains around Ntutu and uh, almost into the Ngorongoro Conservation Area. And they give birth in around about February, here on these short grass plains. So there's not a lot of movement during this period. And then slowly they'll start moving around March, and by April they're coming up quite fast, towards the western sector of the Serengeti and up towards the Grumeti River. And we get many crossings like the ones you see up in the Mara here over the Grumeti River. And probably on both sides of the river, between May and June, the rutting begins. So you get this crazy uh, fighting of the males. They set up little postage stamp sized territories and they remain in those territories sometimes for less than 24 hours because of course the herds are often moving. And so it's a bit of a carnival going on during the rut here. Then they come up, uh, this kind of 
indicates that this is the only wildlife area. In fact, the Grumeti Reserve extends all the way around where I'm showing you there. And the wildebeest herd moves up through that area. And around about June, July, you find them where actually they are now. Now, this is kind of textbook stuff, and it's playing out fairly textbook as we speak. August, you'd expect them in the top parts of the Masai Mara, sometimes in the southern sections during July. And they have done that this year. I will show you a little bit more closely a little bit later on the other map exactly where in the Mara they've been and where they are now. But basically, they're knocking about in this area. And what they'll be doing is coming up into the Mara and then going back out again and coming up into the Mara and then going back out again. And then by August, they'll be making these little sort of circles through the Mara into September and October. And in, in fact, although this map paints it as a movement around the top of the Mara, it's much more a kind of swirling circle that eventually by October starts moving south again. Remember in October last year, we still had many wildebeest up in the Mara. So this is a kind of textbook example of how it goes, but it doesn't always happen like this at all. It continuously goes, though, so it doesn't ever stop happening. So when people ask their travel agents, when on earth does the migration start, uh, you, it's impossible to say. Lady Venom, you say you can't wait for the migration. Well, it's just around here, as I say, and with any luck, we will be able to see it. Uh, in the next couple of weeks or so, that'll be great. Okay, so that's how it goes. And this ecosystem, just to remind you, is around about 2 million hectares. That's without the inclusion of the Ngorongoro Crater conservation area. There's no, there are no fences between uh, the Serengeti and the Ngorongoro, the Grumeti, all of the conservancies to the north. So all in all, probably about 3 million hectares or so close on 7 million acres, which is about 30,000 square kilometers, which turns into about 21,000 square miles odd. That's basically how big this ecosystem is and how much these animals move through. The last thing I wanted to say about this is that we tend to think of the wildebeest, and I said this in the field the other day, as being enormously successful uh, long distance runners. The total distance between here and here is probably about, as the crow flies, I think, if I'm not mistaken, about 700 kilometers or so. And so if you take a roundabout route, it's probably maybe up to about a thousand kilometers. Now, during the course, or I'm not going to do this all in miles as well because it's just too difficult. Between February and August, that is to March, April, May, June, July, and August, that's six months, they move 1,000 kilometers. You divide that by six odd, and you get to roughly 150 kilometers a, a month. And that's not a lot. I mean, if you divide 150 kilometers into a month, you get about five kilometers a day. So it's really not that far. You could easily, even if in your most unfit state, move five kilometers a day. It's about three and a half miles. Obviously, they move more than that because they're swirling around all the time. But the d actual distance that they cover is not massive given that the time that they have to do it. And you'll often hear people quote, well, it's an incredible migration of two and a half thousand kilometers. Yeah, it is, but it's over about 12 months, which really isn't that much when you think about it. And I put this challenge to you the other day for people like uh, Jandre, example, he didn't manage to do it. But if you actually carry your phone with you and do that kind of health thing that it has on your phone, uh, I'd be surprised if, and fairly active human being didn't do almost as much movement during the course of a year. Richard, you say it's a swirling wildebeest. What do you see? What's it? Um, I didn't get that, I'm afraid. I was waffling on too much. A wildebeest cyclone. Yes, it is a little bit of a wildebeest cyclone, especially as it thins up a little bit over here does tend to be a bit of a cyclone. Right, that's all I have to say about that. I hope you have an idea now of the migration pattern as it is on this map over the three million odd uh, hectare ecosystem that we find here. Let us now go down to South Africa. Some, I will give you this in both imperial and metric, 1,600 miles, 2,500 kilometers to Lauren. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last Safari Lives. A bitter sweets, of course, but my name is Lauren and I do have Seb on camera today. Now, I believe Patrick has already mentioned to you that I may be searching for Tandy. I seem to have a lot of luck with Tandy lately. Saying that, I'm probably going to shoot myself in the foot. She was seen at around 11.30 today, which was, of course, well after our drive time. And she was seen going from Twin Dams, which is where we are now, moving in a westward direction. Now, we've just came from that way, and we've been driving so slowly. Seb probably thinks I'm... Geriatric by now, I'm driving this slowly, but I've been trying to pick up any sort of evidence of our tracks, anything, and there's nothing. Apparently she was moving in the drainage lines. Surprise, surprise, how very typical Tandy. But I, I can, we can't get into that drainage. I haven't seen any tracks of her. I only have the information given from the others. So I am gonna keep searching for her, and then I'm gonna move a little bit more centralized and hope to look for Hosanna. And talking of Hosanna, what an eventful week that boy has had. I think the highlight has been him taking revenge on Pretty. Pretty, proudly walking with her kill, had no idea what hit her when Hosanna appeared out of nowhere and ninja swiped her breakfast. A swat on the back and a leap up the tree Pretty had no chance at getting her meal back. Hosanna smugly tucked into his stolen, unidentified delicacy as Pretty, acting like a wounded warrior, mourned her meal below. With a metaphorical and literal bone of contention between them, Pretty finally received a taste of her own medicine. That has to be one of my favorite sightings. Oh, here's a big bird. Can you see that, Seb? I don't even know what it is at the minute, but it's incoming. Oh, wow, I'm gonna need to... Vulture. Whiteback. Oh, it's been a wise while since I've seen a vulture. Actually, a very long while. Hmm, I wonder what you are doing and what you are looking at. Vultures, of course, do need to be up high. They use their eyesight to see what's going down below. They also ride thermals. So many vultures looking in one direction can be a giveaway of something happening below. But also, a vulture does need to perch on a tree, so you can't always rely on that. But still, look at it looking in every single direction back forward, side to side. We might drive a little bit closer, actually, get a better look. So yes, that sighting was one of my favorite sightings of Hosanna. It wasn't mine, it was Miss Patterson's, but it was amazing to see the reaction with Hosanna and Pretty. She looked absolutely shocked to the core. Now, this is a link that I haven't said in a while, but I am so happy to see it. We're gonna send you guys all the way up to Gigi. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is so beautiful. Look at this boy here, who is just coming to investigate and find out what I am made of. Or maybe I look familiar and wondering where I have been. But I'm here, Chambo Chambo. Sorry about all the gremlins we had before. I am not sure that's a good way to start for me on day one, having been home for a couple of weeks or for about two months. But well, these things will happen. Technology is good, but sometimes technology will always play with us. This young boy, I would guess, maybe he just uh, came out of the herd, or the mother, maybe he also showed him the door, or the herd showed him the door, and he is yet to establish uh, a life in where he'll be living. Maybe he's going to join other males elsewhere. Very good camera, Mark James. Well, he's gone. Ladies and gentlemen, I had some news earlier that there were some lions uh, spotted, and that was this morning, uh, James was telling me, and I'm happy to hear that 
even my colleagues, uh, especially uh, Lauren saying, you know, she missed me. I'm sure everybody missed me. And if anybody missed anybody, it's me who missed all of you. I mean, every other time I would wake up and I would imagine one of the directors in the final control, for example, casting, telling me, all right, David, live, live. And I would like jumbo, jumbo. And then I would realize, wow, what a nice dream, but I'm back here and that has given me lots of joy. I have a lot for you. I'll be telling you what I've been doing for the last two months, what I did and where I went. What did you see, James? Let me stop there. And James has also promised at one point he'll be telling us what he has been doing, where he went and all what he did. And he thought we should show you another elephant. And earlier I was telling you, uh, James Henry was out this morning, saw some lion somewhere, and he gave me some bearings. I'll be going there later on to find out if they're there. Most important, before you lost me earlier, I wanted to tell you my plans is to look for that particular pride of lions, which is the Olala pride. And today doing Safari Live, and I think this is Safari Live episode number 56. I cannot believe it. And Castor will be happy if you correct me if it's uh, 56 or not. And what will happen is tomorrow, I can promise you, I'll be going back home. And going back home, I'm sure. All right, Castor tell me I'm correct. It's episode number 56 uh, for the Safari Lives. Sadly, it could be the last one, maybe. I don't know how. Uh, that's pretty sad. But anyway, I just said earlier, tomorrow I'll be going back home. And for most of you who will understand, uh, when I say I'll be going back home, it means I'll be going to the Sausage Republic. So make sure you have a date with me tomorrow because I miss those lions. And I'm trying to imagine if they see me, and especially Kingtail might like, you know, wave. She might wave her king tail like, welcome back, David. So those lions I have missed, I want to find out how those cubs are doing. I left 10. And for such a successful pride, like the sausage pride, two months, it's a long time. And a lot would have happened in those two months in terms of all the dynamics you'd think of. But I'm looking more so of the size of those cubs. I mean, those lions are very good hunters, especially of buffaloes. And I'm imagining by now, those cubs have grown big. The other two are the two oldest cubs there. I'm imagining uh, they must have grown very big. And I remember one of the times when they were feeding on a buffalo, they had the guts to try to intimidate the adults. Like, I also need some space here. Well, what I'll do now, I'll try and head out to the lions that uh, uh, James uh, uh, gave me directions of earlier uh, this morning. But in the meantime, we'll take you back to the studio to James and Ashua. He'll be talking about migration. I'm not sure what happened to the lions, but uh, the hyenas are a very good option. I speak the hyenas. I suspect the lions have gone down into the lager or stream that they have over there. Now, we're going to get back onto the migration discussion, and we're going to be... Well, before we do that, I must just say that that picture of Horsana stealing Pretty's kill is, uh, well, just fantastic. It's one of the best things I've ever seen, I think. Just hilarious, watching the shock on her face as this cheeky leopard came out of the bush. Beautiful stuff. OK, we're going to get onto the migration now, and we're going to talk about the zebra. Here we go. These are the Grant's, Grant's zebra, the smallest of seven subspecies of plains zebra. And they form what we call the vanguard of the herd. There's a very pregnant one there, middle of your screen. That's it. And she carries her baby with her probably most of the way. They're not quite as seasonal as the wildebeest are, but they do move in huge numbers. About 750,000 odd of these fellows make their way at the front, at the head of the Great Migration. And the reason that they are in front is because they eat mostly long grass. So they don't eat the 
culms. The, a, a lot of people think when we say they eat long grass that they'll eat off the stalks with the seeds on them. That's not the case. They eat the leaves at the base of the plants, but the longer leaves, so sort of up to about that length. And they then crop that grass down. And because there's so many of them, they open up a whole area for the wildebeest to come behind them. They too come across the river and must cross and often in great numbers before the wildebeest even get to the Mara. We still haven't seen any big herds of zebra just yet, and obviously they fight quite a lot. And I just want to show you something before they cross the river. Let's just go back a little bit there. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with horses, but these things are basically wild horses, give or take a stripe or two. The horse is blessed with two uh, defensive mechanisms. One, of course, is the powerful kick, as you will see here. Oh, no, I've missed it. Let me just go back a bit. Let's just go back. There we go. We can see that great big kick. And that can be fatal. They can kill each other with a kick like that. Obviously, it didn't affect that animal particularly. The other bit of defense they have is the mouth. They have incredibly powerful jaws and they bite like crazy. And I've told many of you this before. I don't know if you've ever been bitten by a horse. It's extremely unpleasant and they do a lot of harm and they're extremely accurate with their biting. So they are actually equipped with two fairly phenomenal defensive, uh, what should we say, weapons. All right, let's get on to their moving into the water. Zebras, like horses, of course, the single hoof, which gives them probably even less grip than something like a wildebeest. And what you're going to see there is an animal that unfortunately has broken a back leg. Uh, you can see its ears are pinned back on its head in an indication of distress. That's how they indicate distress. If it could be crying, if it could be moaning, I'm very sure it would be. Now, this broken leg, I'm all certain comes from the same thing that broke Brentleo Smith's leg, believe it or not, and that's the rocks underneath the surface of the water. Very slick, and there's no grip on a zebra or a horse's hooves, and it makes them very, very vulnerable to slipping, and that slipping can snap a pretty thin leg for the mass that it's carrying. And if you watch here, if you watch it try and stand up, it's just dreadful to watch. You can see that leg, that back leg there, is basically flopping helpless. It could also have been bitten by a crocodile. I see quite a lot of blood there. So it's possible that it was bitten by a crocodile as well. But there's no way that that zebra is going anywhere. It almost certainly died where it lay. Now, many, many zebra, of course, die in these crossings. Many, many of them get eaten by crocodiles. And as I say, their main role in this migration story is to open up the grazing for the wildebeest and then the Thompson's gazelles that come after them. So that's what they do. When we get into the wildebeest, we'll talk a little bit about death in the water and death outside of being caught by predators. GM, uh, we've never caught a zebra biting a lion, but you do see footage of it from time to time, absolutely. They bite each other. They will certainly use their teeth to defend their foals from predators if they can. Lions, not so much, because they tend, like most animals, when they're attacked by big predators, to give up and leave the victim to their fate. They don't often turn around and rally around uh, an animal that is being killed. You will see it in the river. When the crocodiles come for them, they just scatter. And if something manages to get hold of their friends, well, then they just find new friends, unfortunately. Let's go back down to South Africa, where Patrick has not found his character yet, but he has found an avian predator. Well, we've found ourselves a very cool-looking bird here. Now, I believe this one is called a shikra. Uh, I don't know a whole heap about this bird, but it is definitely very, very cool. It kind of has that sort of falcon look about it. A long tail feather, and I think the markings across its breast there, those white vertical, I mean horizontal, sorry, stripes, are uh, very... Oh, and off it goes. That's a nice little sighting there. Now, how good is it to have both David Kudu and the Mara back? I, uh, I'm very, very much looking forward to him heading up to the sausages tomorrow. I hope he can find them because oh, they pop into my head a lot. The sausages and the Owinos, I dearly, dearly miss those two prides. And, well, I one day would hope to get back up there and, and see them again.
So as for my search, it is still not coming up too fruitful at the moment. I haven't found any real tracks. There was a few lion tracks back there, but they seem to be heading east, which I believe are lions that have moved into. Oh, where's my radio here? So yes, it's not a... Uh... Okay, that's a mouthful that that bird was. It was a Gabar Goshawk, I believe I heard. Uh, that's, yeah, okay, okay, that would make sense. Very cool though, very cool to see a different bird out here. Another one, I saw, so the green pigeon was one I hadn't seen the other day to add to my bird list, and this was another one now that I've never seen before. So that is good. I want to rack up as many birds as I can before I go. Now, as I said, no real tracks or anything, but I am still kind of up in the northern area looking around for any signs of Tengana. And speaking of that cat, we did manage to catch up with him last week. And let's go to that one now. The Duke started off his morning in golden light. He seemed in a calm, peaceful, almost meditative state before heading off to work. Back to patrolling his territory and keeping the youth in line. Always a pleasure to catch up with Tingana, the old Duke. And well, I would also like to see Hosanna as well. I haven't seen him for quite some time. Well, yeah, I did see him briefly the other day. When, but uh, yeah, no real, no real updates with him either. It seems to be a pretty, pretty chilled out afternoon here on Joomla. I have just been going at a very, very slow pace, trying to be super observant. Actually, it was uh, quite nice earlier, but uh, I'll tell you all about that later because we are going back across to Lauren now to see how her search is going. So another vulture landed just after we sent you all the way up to Gigi. So we just got a bit suspicious. I mean, two's not that many, especially when you see carcasses in Namara, surrounded by vultures. But we couldn't see a particular direction that they were looking in. But I thought it was at least worth checking this road because Tandy was spotted this morning and she's very well renowned for hunting and hoisting her own kills. And two, the vultures and battaliers just felt like something was going on. Haven't picked up on anything, not even a single trap or, of course, an animal actually we do have three giraffes over here it's been a while since we've seen giraffes on juma that i was actually trying to show you they are so far away i can't seem to get sort of a gap in the way that seb can actually show them to you so i'm sorry about that but they are there and it's very 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 nice to see giraffes but i'm not sure we're actually going to be able to get you a visual but i will try my best what i am going to do is try and go around come in and at least try and get them, even if it's a far away shot. So of course, it's not just Hosanna and Pretty's interaction that has made this week so special. I think the highlight for everyone that stole everyone's heart was of course, the first time we saw the Inkahuma Cubs. Finally, the moments we have all been waiting for. Not one, but two bundles of cub cuteness. The newest additions to the Inkahuma Pride. The ridged nose lioness, like any good mother, made sure her babies were fed and bathed before attempting to put them to bed with some lion lullabies. Adorable. I obviously haven't seen them yet, but it is so nice to actually know the Inkahumas have got little cubbies. I spent much time up in the Mara with Olololo cubs, which unfortunately didn't make it. Um, Salt Lake cubs, 
Which other cubs did we spend time with? I actually never got to see the Owino cubs, but there was lots of cubs. And it's just so nice to know that there's little cubbies with the Inkahuma pride, our main dominant pride around here. I haven't even seen the Inkahumas for some time. It's interesting all the lion dynamics that are happening here. Of course, we don't always get the full story, but there's a lot evolving. The Avokas, the Talamatis, Inkahumas, and of course, we had the Styx pride. Now they, I haven't heard any update on them also. They seem to be very nomadic at the moment. They lost their eldest member of the pride and they seem, from what I can gather, to just be really, really wandering, quite literally. And this was their territory a long time ago, so it's almost as if they just came back. I think I'm gonna go this way. So it's just been a very, very interesting time in terms of lion dynamics. But let's just hope these two little cubbies make it to adulthood, of course. The mortality rate for lion cubs is indeed high, but hopefully, 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 they will be in the survival percentage. And we can watch them grow up, we can follow them. The mother, Ridge Nose, is obviously moving them around quite a fair bit at the moment. So we're not actually always aware where they are, but hopefully, once they get a little bit older, we can actually spend some more time with them. I'm desperate to see them. So as we bumble into the bright white light of the sun, we are going to throw you all the way back up to Mr. Hendry. We are not in the bright lights of the sun. We have some very nice daylight outside, but we're not in the bright lights of the sun. No, there are some little mouse birds outside, but I'm not sure we'll see them. We'll probably just see dirt on the windows if we try and show you those okay we're going to talk about the wildebeest now i think let's get straight into the clip here i go there they are thousands and thousands and thousands up to 1.2 million wildebeest eventually go into the Masai mara out of the serengeti let's just have a look at that again let's go back a bit and have a look at the extent of those. Now, I'm not sure if you're able to conceive of uh, 1.2 million animals. I am unable to conceive of 1.2 million animals. You're not looking at 1.2 million animals there. I would say that you're probably looking at about 10, let's say it would fit into here about 100 times. I don't think you're looking at more than 20,000 wildebeest in this particular picture. So you can imagine that thing uh, multiplied by 5, 50, plus another 200,000, so 54. 54 times, roughly, what you're looking at on the screen. It's an astonishing number of animals. Right, there we go. Look at them. Now, they do make this crossing of the Mara River every single year, and they don't do it just once. Now, I must just quickly stop over there and have a look at what can only be described as a circus going on on the left-hand side of the screen at the top there. Look how many people there are, half of them standing on the tops of their vehicles. And while I wouldn't describe the operations of the safari guides in this area as necessarily being particularly well-sensitive, it does show you how amazingly popular this wildlife spectacle is. And the more popular a wildlife spectacle is, of course, the more important it is to conservation. And so the more people that come and watch this, albeit in a slightly more sensitive manner, the better it is for this ecosystem and for wildlife in general. All right, let's carry on playing. These are the first crossings that you'd expect the wildebeest to make in the Masai Mara. Oof, and these are horrible ones to watch. They're not like the ones that we have up north here. These ones are steep. There are many broken bones and legs here. And I suspect if I stop it over there, these ones in the bottom of your screen are almost certainly lying there for the same reason that that wildebeest, was, at least that zebra, was lying in the last clip. It's because they've injured themselves very badly and, in fact, they can no longer move. So those that manage to walk down, it's all fine. But unfortunately, those chaps, I suspect, have broken a front leg, a humerus or something like that, and that'll be the end of that. Then the lucky ones come out the other side. Amazing to watch. Look at them, they're falling into holes and all sorts of things. All right, now, what we're seeing here is 
of the floating of many carcasses down the river. And about 6,000 or so wildebeest die in this river between the northern crossings around the Kichwatembo airstrip down to the Purangat Bridge, which is where the Mara enters the Serengeti. 6,000 wildebeest die in this during a migration season. And there they all are, lying rotting in the river. That translates apparently to around about 1,000 tons. Okay, so 1,000 tons is a million kilograms of biomass flowing into the Serengeti and feeding many of the scavengers, uh, feeding the crocs, feeding the river, feeding the fish, feeding all the algae. And so although this seems like a dreadfully sad and uh, let me tell you, very smelly experience to go and ex watch something like this, it does serve a natural purpose. And as with most of the migration, absolutely nothing goes to waste at all. Now, Bunga, you stay that side of the map. I'll go this side. I just need my pointing stick, which I have since lost. Oh, here it is. Good. On a closer or a smaller scale, if you like, Ian, I'll get to your question now. This is what we've seen so far. So I described exactly where the wildebeest are at the moment and the zebra. And this is the Serengeti Mara boundary. OK. That's the boundary between Kenya and Tanzania and the Serengeti and the Mara. The whole of the Serengeti is in Tanzania. The whole of the Mara is in Kenya. This is around about where some of the herds are now. Tristan is hiding his way to an area probably around about here on the edge of the table. And he's probably about 200 kilometers south of that position. No, not quite that far. About 50 kilometers south of that position now. He's just told me he's in amongst some wildebeest. So they are in and around that area. However, many have, in fact, come up already into the Mara, and they have made one or two of those very steep crossings that you saw over there. They've crossed over the river. Many have been devoured. Well, the crocodiles are actually not that numerous in that area. They are around, but not that numerous. But many of them came down there. Many of them would have then floated down towards the Purungat Bridge and rotted kind of as they floated into the Serengeti. Haven't seen big herds of zebra yet, which is a little odd. So I feel like the wildebeest that have come up are probably jumping the gun a bit, perhaps thinking to themselves, if we get up there early, uh, we won't be eaten, or things will be better, we won't be standing on so much dung of our colleagues, something like that. But that's happened, then they've turned around and they've gone back south. So they're all back south waiting to come back up and see us here in the Masai Mara. So that is the state of play of the migration of that great big herd. Let me just go through those numbers once again for you. 750,000 zebra, 1.2 million wildebeest, about 200,000 Thompson's gazelles will also be coming up behind those. We didn't see them last year, so I'm not sure why we didn't see those. And apparently also 20,000 Irland will move with the herds right at the back as well. So those are the two million animals making up the great migration of the Serengeti Mara ecosystem. Thank you. I think that's all I have to say about that particular subject. Ah, Ian, yes, you want to know how high the river is at the moment. It's not as high as I've seen it, but it's relatively high. It's difficult to actually describe without showing you a picture of it. Um, if we go back to this clip, I'm not sure. Kirsten, can we go back to the clip? I think we'll probably go back to the clip. If we go over here, we just go back to this particular area. It's about this high. That's roughly the height of the river at the moment. So it's pretty much at that level. This is from last year, and the river's about that high, maybe slightly higher. So there's quite a lot of good water in it at the moment, and it is flowing. OK, let's go. Are we going to, oh, we're going to actually one of the clips that I, I voiced. That's very nice. I nearly sent you to David, who, of course, has just got back. Let's go back across now, or let's go to a little highlights package of the Olalola Pride feasting uh, on our re re return. We returned to the Mara to find the Olololo's fine dining on a buffalo, three lionesses and two young males. The Kichwa boys, 
protectors or sponges of the Ololos, depending on your perspective, supped with them. One of the lionesses isn't well, showing some strange swelling in her genital region, walking very uneasily. All proceeded fairly typically, with the males sauntering in to eat when they wanted and testing for possible estrus in one lioness. The only mystery was where the rest of the pride are, another few lionesses and five young males. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to the Mara Triangle. Now, the lions uh, James Henry was just talking about that had a very good feast of a buffalo, these are the ones here. I'm sorry, it's not the very best view we got because this grass is very high. But if you look carefully, you can see some black mane to the left, which I guess that could be a male lion. Thank you, James. And it's very typical for lions in the heat of the day, like now, just to go flat. Well, James, earlier when I arrived in the Mara or in the camp, he gave me the directions on where to get these lions, and I do not think they moved very far. James must have mentioned this. With the absence of the wildebeest, with the absence of the zebras, most of the lions in the Mara, including this particular pride, who have been dealing with buffaloes to survive. And as we all know, and I'm sure James might have said, the, uh, well, the, I mean, the, the uh, wildebeest rather, they're not very far from getting to this area. They must have touched the boundary already between Kenya and Tanzania. So what you can see is just them tweaking their tails up and down. And yeah, you can see that. And this is the very famous Olo Lolo Pride. This one that has put her head up, which is pretty good. One thing I picked up very quickly as I was landing in the Mara this morning is the grass might have gone about three, four inches higher from what I left when I was going home two months ago. That's another female, and it's a composition of about four fully grown females, four young adult females, and about, I guess, nine sub-adult males. I mean, it's about 18 went all together, including their pride males. Uh, there's one called Fang, this one that has gone up. It's very good. Do you want to rise and shine now? Of course, the temperatures have gone considerably down, and what would happen, they'll get to be more active. They're taking some very good shade of a uh, bosque tree. Paula, a very good afternoon. And how have you been, Paula? I've missed to hear your name. I've missed your questions, Paula. And can tell you, Paula, 150%. Don't miss. And I'm sure you heard me earlier, Paula, when I was saying, tomorrow I'm going back home. I am going back to the Society Republic. And it's because it's rather warm. I have only my shirt and one T-shirt in there of Safari Live. Tomorrow, I'm sure going to be chilly. I'll have three layers, a T-shirt, a shot and your favorite, my favorite, our favorite green sugar. So, Paula, don't miss the sausage. And chances are, I'll see them. I have missed uh, those lions. Well, I'm seeing, well, another one has gone up, James. Did you see that one there? So, Paula, I'll be happy to show you my green sugar tomorrow. Hello. Very good. And there's some elephants there. If you, James, you go a little bit further there, if you look carefully, there's some elephants, and I'm trying to imagine, if they're going to walk this way, they'll make all these lions to rise up. It's an early there. See the difference of the grass? There's much shorter, much greener. And a big herd to the left. Thank you, James. Very, very good, ladies and gentlemen. So what I will do, I'm going to spend a few more minutes here, hoping that uh, these lions are going to rise up and move around. In the meantime, we'll take you back to Juma, to part where I think I have a feathered friend. Well, we have come across yet another bird of which I don't think I've ever seen before. My thoughts here are, is, it, is that it is maybe a falcon or a kestrel. 
It looks to be one of those sorts of species, a smaller bird of prey, but the specific one, I'm not sure. It was actually spotted very nicely by Craig. I definitely would have seen it. It's actually camouflaged quite well. Because we're zoomed in, you, it looks like it stands out, but from back here, it's blended in very well with that tree. You could easily, easily mistake it for a branch there. But if anyone does know what that bird is, please do let me know using the hashtag Safari Live. It will definitely be another one to add to the list. Now, Craig just said he heard monkeys alarming, so I'm just gonna ask him where, which direction. Okay, okay, sure. But yeah, my thoughts is that this is definitely some small bird of prey, maybe a, I'm thinking perhaps a kestrel. Okay, so James reckons it's a juvenile African goshawk. So another goshawk. That's uh, very, very cool. Two, two goshawks in one drive is not bad at all, considering I've never seen one before in my life. So thank you very much for that, James. Uh, let's continue on now that we know this one. It's turned out to be quite a birdie drive. We actually saw a black-headed oriole earlier on as well, which is the first one I've seen in months, months and months. Now, it's been all lions over the last week. We saw the Incahumas, we saw the Avokas, and we were also lucky enough to catch up with the sticks. The Sticks made a surprise visit to Juma after a long hiatus. It looks as if the mange has persisted within this group as they licked away at their patchy coats. Although slightly unhealthy, it doesn't seem like the pride has lost any members. It was a pleasure having a catch up with this sleepy pride. Well, always good to see a pride of lions that we don't often see, even though they were looking not in the greatest conditions. It was still good to catch up with them. At Mange, I could only imagine very, very frustrating. That, uh, well, any, any skin condition like that is, can be very, very irritating. And I could only imagine for a poor lion, it would be horrendous. But uh, last night's TV show, we also had the clip of the Sticks Pride when they unfortunately killed that wild dog. I wasn't actually aware of that sighting until I saw that clip last week and I could only imagine it was absolutely heartbreaking for Brent to see. So it looks like Lauren and I are gonna do a little bit of a switcheroo. Apparently Hosanna is around somewhere, so she's gonna follow up on that. And I'm going to tag in and head on down south now and have a look around for Tandy. Hopefully I can pick up on something. I haven't seen the queen for quite some time. I believe the last time I saw her was when she was with Tralamba and Tralamba hoisted the kill. That was an amazing, amazing sighting. But since then I haven't seen the queen or to the lumber even. So either of the two would be nice. Okay, well, I was speaking about Lauren searching for Hosanna. She's actually probably just over there doing that right now. Let's go and see how she's going. Am I live? Oh, okay. I did try to warn Kirsten. Something is wrong with my earpiece, so I can't hear anything. I am going to adjust it. This happens a lot. And Seb will translate. And we'll figure it out. Don't worry. So, I believe Hosano is somewhere around. I am hoping we can bump into him. Just need to scan up ahead a little bit. We're going to go past the lodge, so... Alrighty, thank goodness for Sebastian. What would I do without him? Um, as we look around here, he is somewhere here. I just need to do a Ferrari safari and try and find him in time. There was an epic fail 
by our boy this week. Let's go and take a look at what happened. Having no patience for his meal this afternoon, Hosanna launched into turbo leopard mode, surprising the Impala and then surprising himself when he failed to catch one. The Impala were not amused. Hosanna was not amused. So he slunk off, looking a little sheepish that we all just watched that happen. Yeah, just here. Wasn't that a moment? I really didn't expect it. I was on Kids Drive and I was with Seb actually, and we just did not expect him to go into full launch turbo mode, and of course he did. So there was surprises all round, but Hosanna failing on a hunt like that is completely normal. I mean, we often love to think of him as a, oh, Pala are not looking too happy over here, as a bit of a goofball, but of course he is all of our goofball, but failed hunts are entirely normal. That is how it works for leopards and lions. They do make several, several attempts before they get lucky. It takes a lot of sort of calculations, distance, speed. They've got to gauge depth. They've got to look at everything before they can actually make a decision to spring like that. And obviously Hosanna in this instance did not make a great calculation. And he terrified the Impala who were very upset. And of course, I think he shocked himself. But entirely normal. Only 16% of attempted hunts in the Kruger actually land in success for leopards. So that was just another part of the 84. Okay, we've got him. Um, I think I have to... Okay. Oh, hey boy. Okay, I'm going to need to reposition and fix my earpiece as well. I don't have any... Of course, I'm sorry if you're speaking to me. I don't have any. Are we still live, eh? Okay, we're still live. Better not say anything bad then. <laughs> I'm only joking. He's right here. Hey, boy, we're just talking about you. Yeah, I see him. Oh, well, hello. Where on earth have you been? He's like, oh, you know, just hanging around, doing my thing. Well, I believe I have to send you somewhere. David. No, I, oh, it's David. Up to the morrow of Gigi. Well, it's very good to watch one predator walking, but we got two here, or we got two lions here that are not walking, but they seem to be focused on something that we do not know. Well, the two rows and the other two, so four of them woke up, and these are the sabbaths I was talking about. But from where they're looking, something tells me there's something they can see. And as I was coming down here like uh, 15 minutes ago, I saw some toppies from a distance. Well, this pride is huge by any standard. I mean, anything 15 and above, uh, a toppy will be just a small little snack. And as I said earlier, uh, most of the prides of lions in the Mara have been working or dealing with buffaloes for survival. Now, look at those faces, look at those eyes, and you can see they are focused at something. Well, I do not know how I can see her head just going down as she concentrates looking in a particular direction, but that maybe helps identify or explain to them what it could be. In the background there, you can see the beautiful Olaro escarpment, and that's not very far from where we live. Now, these sub I'm looking at them very soon, uh, having their own coalition. We've got about two uh, pride males of this uh, particular uh, pride here. And I'm trying to imagine if the seven or the nine we think you join them, there'll be 11. Debra, very good comment. How beautiful is the Mara? I mean, anytime Mara, as I was saying earlier, Debra, I hope you're following. When I go to bed, I do Mara. When I wake up, I wake up Mara. And you cannot get a better place than Mara in the world. Thank you, Debra. Always a pleasure to hear your name after a couple of weeks that we have been missing. But now we are back in town. 
Now, this youngster here is a young male, and I'm not sure he's trying to encourage the other ones on what direction to go. But what I personally saw earlier there was a herd of about 10, 12 toppies. Being youngsters, as they train on how to hunt one day when they become, you know, out of the pride when they're shown the door, they should start hunting from small prey to big prey. Now, what has happened is they just moved away, and what you need to do, we may move forward a little bit and find out if we can catch up with them. But those four there, James, if you look carefully, they seem to be following the path pathfinder, which I think is the younger male there. But these two, as yet, haven't made an important move. So what they'll do, they'll take any slight opening of the grass and they'll stay there because it's elevated and take it as a vantage point. And they'll be looking around to see what could be happening. Just look at that grass, look at the height. And I can tell you, not one prey can see them walk through that grass. It's very easy for them to pounce uh, on, say, a buffalo or a topi or a hat beast or a zebra because they blend in very well. That's the orange leafed croton, some other bushes there. So we have seen three move forward. We got three still at the back, four rather. And by their body language, you can tell they're thinking of getting some early dinner. I won't be surprised if they bring a toppy down, but as they say, that's going to be a very quick meal. And seeing these lions, I cannot wait to go to the Sausage Republic tomorrow morning. And I'm sure you know, zero seven hundred hours, I'll be out to do that. Well, I'm going to stay here and wait. When the migration comes, we have always seen some of these predators taking advantage of that, be it lions, be it crocs and James Henry won't touch on those reptiles. We are going to talk about some crocodiles now, and they, of course, have been waiting very patiently for the migration for some time. Before we get into our crocodile clip, this is an actual replica of a crocodile skull. So it's a massive one. I think probably about the same size as some of the... You're not hearing my microphone? Maybe. You're hearing it. We're hearing it fine. It's 20. It's on your side. Uh, uh, muffling my mic. I'm with you. Okay. Audio. Sorry about that. Yes. Uh -huh. I'm with you. Okay. I muffled it like what that. Audio, Sorry about that. Dreadful. Okay. So one of these big crocodiles, which is probably about the same size as some of the monsters we're going to show you now. Now, I have explained this. I explained this during the migration series, but I'm going to explain it to you again now. This animal is able to bite with the force of some three... 1,700 pounds per square inch. Now, it's almost impossible to sort of conceive of until you consider that your own bite is around about 140 to 150 pounds per square inch. So, you know, massively, massively more powerful than the human bite. It's what I wanted to show you here is, is this here. There's a massive chewing muscle that goes in there. And that's what allows this jaw to clamp shut with the astonishing force that it does. But what is also ama equally amazing to me, and I'm going to try a little trick here and let's see if it works. I hope it works. Are you ready? Yeah, it worked. What you see is that the teeth don't come down on each other because biting down at that force, they'd absolutely smash their teeth out of their jaws if they did allow the jaws to sort of snap down. And the other interesting thing is the design of the teeth. The teeth themselves are not designed for chewing and they're not actually designed for stabbing. They're designed more for, they're designed more for grabbing. And you can see the way they're designed here. They're not as sharp as a lion's canines and they're certainly not as blunt or, or as, um, what should we say? Yes, as blunt as a herbivores, but they're also not uh, molars like you'd find on a lion or a leopard. And that is because in order to make sure that the jaws close o tooth over tooth as opposed to tooth on tooth without doing any damage, this animal cannot move its jaws from side to side. So while you and I can do the following, 
so can a herbivore, so can a lion. This animal cannot do that. It can only open its jaws up and down. All right. And that's to avoid that tremendous injury. So that's a crocodile. That is the equipment that it has in order to do what we're going to show it doing here. And that's roughly the same size, I'd say, as that crocodile there. It probably stretched to around about 12 feet when it was uh, extant. That's a replica, but it was made from a real crocodile skull. There they are. They're everyone's sort of favorite n villain in nature. Uh, many like to hate them. I don't like to hate them. I certainly wouldn't like to be around one. Uh, there's something about a reptile, of course, that is, well, shall we say, sinister to many people. Their greatest strategy outside of the crossings is waiting for the impatience for animals like this one to come down and have a drink. Now, you can see one crocodile in this picture. You're about to see another. Oh, there it is. Zebra, not very clever. Not really sure how that zebra missed that. Let's have another look at that. It's quite impressive. In fact, I wonder, I suspect that quite a few animals out here in the Maasai Mara die of stupidity rather than anything else. Watch this. You can actually see the zebra is looking basically straight at the crocodile as it breaks the surface. Hopeless. It actually kicks its mate on its, in its attempt to get out. Anyway, then, of course, their other main source of income, if you like, or source of food, is the crossings. And you'll read statistics like crocs can go for two years without eating any food. I'm not sure that anyone's actually ever managed to work that out seriously, but they can certainly go a few months without food, possibly two years, if they are really, really fat and well-fed. What is for sure is that before these crossings happen, they have not been eating a lot, these crocodiles. But they're not always successful hunting in this manner. Watch. Rather like all the other predators, there's a good chance that their prey will escape. They're jumping over them, jumping on them, and then, of course, they go back under the water, and that's it. And look at this guy fight. He does a tremendous job of getting out of those jaws. I'm not sure how. Well, I actually am sure how. You'll notice him jumping on the bottom of the water there. As soon as these animals are unable to stand, they become very, very vulnerable to the crocodiles. When they can push off the rocky bottom and they can get purchase, they're able to often pull their way out before the crocodiles can get a proper good grip like they had, unfortunately, on this poor thing here. This does get a little bit gory, so I'm sorry about that, but this is the reality of those crossings. Remember, far more get through than actually get caught, so just remember that as you watch this. Now, there's no chance that that thing is going to escape. And there is a colleague being pushed under the water and drowning. They'll mostly drown, and some, of course, after drowning, will be torn to pieces. Now, we know that the crocodile's method of tearing their food apart is this classic crocodilian roll. They turn like that, and that's because they cannot chew. And often there'll be one crocodile on one end of the animal, and then another on the other end of the... At least one crocodile on the one end of the prey, and another on the other end, and they do that classic roll. Let's go back to it. I think it's quite interesting. And that's how they break them up. Remember, I just told you that they cannot chew. They have no method of chewing or breaking up their food other than doing this. So the powerful grip, and then they must twist and turn. And in fact, in areas where there are fewer crocodiles and where they do just take prey off the, or off the um, shore, they will often take the prey and put it under the water and let it rot because they can't actually turn it over enough to break a piece off because there aren't other crocodiles doing the same sort of thing. So that's the crocodiles. Everyone's favorite natural villain. I'm still trying to love them. I will tell you, uh, I, I, I find that I manage over the course of a season and then my love for them dies slowly and I have to relearn to love the crocodiles. No. No, Francis, I don't think that's true at all. The tip of the crocodile's snout is not soft. If you hit it, it will not retreat. In fact, it's most likely, if you touch a crocodile's snout, it's likely to turn around and grab you. And often the, what they do is they sideswipe 
Uh, yeah, no. If, apparently, the only way to escape a crocodile, well, there are two ways to escape a crocodile if you have the presence of mind to do this if you're ever caught. The first one is to take your thumb and stick it into the crocodile's eye. If you manage to do that hard enough, apparently they do let go. The other method, and this is a method that was very famous or made famous by a Johannesburg father in the mid-80s. He lost his arm. His son was taken by a crocodile, was grabbed. And in order to make the crocodile let go, he got in to its jaws and he pushed his arm down its throat. And what that does is that it opens the gular flap and the crocodile starts to drown, so it immediately lets go. But it let go of his son, but it took his arm. And I remember my mother meeting him uh, once at a computer course. Can you believe that? Back in the 80s when computer courses were around. A very nice chap, but that's how he lost his arm shoved his hand down a crocodile's throat in order to save him. I'm not sure who we're linking to now. I think it's Lauren with Hosanna. Let's go and find out. Maybe it'll be a um, surprise. <laughs> well, was James actually giving advice on how to save yourself from being attacked by a crocodile? I think I'm going to have to go back and watch that. But funnily enough, we were just having that discussion in camp the other day about how to escape a shark attack and how you would escape a leopard attack. The bizarre conversations we have. But of course, we've caught up with our boy and I followed all the tech advice that Conrad and Marcel always give me with my earpiece and it's to wiggle. So I wiggled every little piece and I wiggled some more and now I can hear Kirsten's voice beautifully in my ear. So I apologise about that and thank goodness for Seb. Now, do you know what Seb said the first time we saw him? He was, we were, he was walking a little bit further away at a distance and Seb said, oh my goodness, he looks just like Tingana these days. And we were looking at his dewlap, that sort of saggy bit of skin underneath his, well, chin, neck, and it's really filling out. And the rate he's eating, he is a fat, full cat on a regular basis these days. He's hunting and eating regularly. Nothing's stopping him. And he's really filling out. So, of course, I mentioned him only having success with 16% of his kills. He won't just kill, he scavenged. This boy scavenged more than we ever realized. And recently, he took a scrub hair from his little sister. Making the most of being a big brother. Hosanna robbed poor Tlalamba of most of her scrub hair dinner. In typical sibling fashion, they both took to the trees to finish whatever remains they had won from the tug of war. Tlalamba licked her paws defiantly, pretending not to care that Hosanna had stolen most of her meal. But this changed as Hosanna climbed down the tree and approached her perch. This wasn't her most graceful or finest hour, as she snarled and hissed, whilst making a small deposit on the tree. Throwing caution to the wind, she seized the opportunity to switch trees, hoping that her scrub hair was not swallowed whole. And Hosanna took this moment to see exactly what Tlalamba thought of him. What an incredible moment that was. It was a Seb as well. I think we're a bit of a team extreme here. And of course, we weren't sure at first, but it was confirmed that he took the scrub here from Tlalamba. And of course, he got most of it. She did manage to get some part of it. And that was the incident where she obviously did poo in the tree when there was lots of talk about that as well. So Hasana knows exactly what leopards are around him, what threats are around him. And he knows that Tlalamba is not a threat at all. She's a very small, petite, young female who he can, of course, use his size and strength against and steal her food, which is not ideal for her, but it's obviously a win-win for him. So I think two of the clips that we have actually showed you this evening have shown Hosanna stealing food from other animals, Klalamba and Pretty, the hyena. So he's well and truly adapted at scavenging, as well, of course, as hunting. He's a growing man. He's going straight for that termite mound, I think. 
but I hope so. Please stop at the termite man boy, otherwise you're going to be very difficult to catch up with. This block is a thick one. He's not stopping, is he? No. no. <laughs> Oh yes, he he's having a scan around. Let's bash through here and see if we can get a little bit closer. No, that's not ideal. You know, this is a block I've lost him on numerous occasions. Sorry, Seb. There's lots and lots of talk about why Tlalamba poops, and it could just be that she was emptying herself, if you like. She was emptying her bubbles in order to just shown the other vehicle where to go in order to sort of flee you know fight or flight in order to get ready to jump escape him she knows he's not going to attack her if you like but in order to get out of there maybe it was just sort of an automatic reaction boop and leave i don't think it was territorial or aggressive in any way um obviously we don't know why the cats poo well we know why they poo they need to get rid of it but generally why she did that there and then it could just be a response sort of an automatic response get it out and go she obviously was not happy with them she was snarling she was really standing her ground actually but of course things happen accidents happen to us all alrighty we're gonna try and keep up with this highly mobile Hosano and while we do that back over to David Well, Hosanna was my very first leopard to see in Juma. That was uh, early last year. And I was very excited because he was very close to the car. And I think I was the James Henry. And the come up then was Sebastian. And both James Henry and Sebastian kept telling me, don't worry, David, don't panic. All is under control. He was about two meters away. Well, we got a lion here, a lioness here that's about 200 meters away. But James, if you allow me, sorry, to just ambush you, we got one of the big boys I was talking about earlier who just put up his head. Now, I was talking of the pride or, or the, you know, the, the male pride. Are the males of this particular Olero Pride, and they are normally two. There used to be three, but currently we got two. We got one that we call Half Tail, and we got another one that we call Fang. Well, in that particular position, it's rather difficult for me to tell who he is, unless, of course, he stands up. And as their name suggests, you cannot mistake them. Half Tail, you'll see part of the tail is missing, and I'll tell you for a fact, I have no idea what might have happened to that part of the tail and then the second one which we call fang is missing a tooth right here so i want to believe this whole pride have been together the two males the fully grown adults sub adults aha so he has risen up and that is half tail boom we go ahead do boom a few minutes earlier, I want to take you back to the very lioness that was on a termite mount because on top of that termite, I want termite mount, I'm sure Cassie might have seen a lioness that was there and I do not know what happened to her. She just fell off and rolled off. I'm not sure whether Cassie you are able to play that or not, but it was very interesting to see how she came, you know, falling from that particular termite mount. What do you think, Cassie? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you of all the directors, Casti is very sharp. She never misses an occasion. And that was a slow mo of that particular unit you're seeing walking there. How she came falling on that Tamad Mount, I have no idea because it left us, me and James, just hilariously laughing, wondering what actually happened to it. Was it dreaming? But initially she was up and looking. But she went just sliding down. Well, I got a feeling they might be walking towards these two boys here, which is very exciting to come to this very handsome man. 
Yes, I agree with all of you. That was very funny. That how she came down from that summit mount. It is interesting because you wonder was she absent minded? Did she have, you know, uh, a nap in a split of a second and like lost her balance and came down? Well, she is definitely coming to her pride member. And these, I think, are the some of the two of the four fully grown adults in this particular pride. Hello, sister. There could be fast cousins also. It's greetings. Grooming. Very typical for lion to turn around. Legs up. And from a distance, I can hear some hippos and some alleys quite far. All right. The temperatures having gone down is very typical for all cats, you know, lions, cheetahs, and leopards to rise and move around and fast they always stretch and they keep moving on. Well, these lions, I'm sure they cannot wait for the wildebeest to come here. And I'm talking of the breathtaking migration, which James is vividly talking about today. I'm just taking a breath to appreciate the migration control room where I find myself now. It's very special to be back in here on my favorite sofa with a cushion that Steph found somewhere. I'm not sure why he has sullied the migration control room with that cushion. Maybe I shall have a strong word with him after this show. Right, we're now going to look at some of the hunting that takes place on the banks of the Mara River. Many of you will remember the following little clip. Quite remarkable. And before I play it, let me just remind you that it was shot from a balloon. So it is an aerial shot, shot from a balloon, which means that there is no way to make the balloon stop. There's no way to make it arrive at this particular point when it did arrive at this point. There is no way of stopping it as the action unfolds underneath it. So the number of things that had to serendipitously serendipitously coincide for what you're about to see now is just astonishing. This is Manu in the balloon uh, in 2017. So there is, we're floating over the river and we can see a crocodile coming Oh, sorry, it was Senzor, it wasn't Manu. Here we've got a crocodile coming from the right-hand side and one from the left. Now, the one on the left is now having a go at the zebra. You can see it having a bite, but because the zebra can hit, reach the ground, manages to kick away. The second one is too slow. I don't believe that crocodiles are born of enormous intelligence. And the zebra thinks, sweet, I'm out of danger. But, of course, the zebra is not out of danger because lurking in the grasses, as is their wont, comes the Paradise Pride. Two or three lionesses of the Paradise Pride which ply their trade both sides of the Mara River during the migration. There they come through the grass, they've seen only one zebra coming, and now they're gonna get it. Now, what's interesting here is that they cannot see over the grass. If you look at this particular sort of setup, they know the zebra's coming out, they've got a vague idea of where it's gonna go. But to see over this long grass is very difficult. And the zebra sees the lion first. It's just seen the lion in this particular paused frame that you can see now. You can see the head's up, and now it's in a panic. Watch it move. Panic, seen both of them. And now it turns its backside to try and kick, but no chance in that long grass. And what's astounding to me here is that the lioness manages to wrestle it to the ground and stop it moving. Let's just go back there. I'm just going to take you back to the actual wrestling. I wonder how slowly I can play it for you. Let's... Uh, no, not very slowly. It would nice be nice to do this frame by frame, but we can't do that. Okay, so let's play. See how he turns to his backside to try and kick the lioness, but the grass is too long, so he doesn't make contact. Then he trips and falls, and she's on him in a flash. And this is a serious tackle she's pulling off. That's a 350 kilogram animal. Uh, it's a grand zebra, so maybe 300 kilogram animal. And she probably weighs in the region of two, 120 kilograms. So mm, let's say two and a half to three times her mass. And down it goes. Now, although the zebra is powerful, its back and legs are not nearly as flexible as the lionesses. 
And so you have a situation here where the lioness's greater flexibility allows it to keep the zebra from getting a foothold on the ground and standing up. Because if the zebra could stand up, it would be strong enough to shake her off. And what it does is it tries desperately to get a foothold. She turns its spine over so that it cannot get its feet underneath it, and then the other lioness comes in. This is the same lionesses. You can see we're late into the migration at this stage because look at the size of that belly. That's not a pregnant lioness. That's a lioness that's been eating too much. And now she doesn't really know what to do. So she's kind of playing here. There she half-heartedly goes after one, gets bashed by a, it's a cow, bashes her, and now she waits. And all these wildebeest, of course, come out of the river, and they can see the lioness, but they don't really know what to do. They try and dodge her. They don't know if they're more in the grasses. They're just running blind. <coughs> Excuse me. And now she's trying to decide, what do I do here? You see, she's not lactating at all. She's just got a big fat belly from a lot of meat. Now she waits. Oh, she thinks there's more action to be had here. Now, to me, this is a great exemplar of... Exemplar. Great exa example of these lionesses hunting for the sake of hunting. Chasing balls of wool in the same way that your kitten at home would chase a ball of wool or a catnip packed fish as my mother cats my mother's cat likes to do she's not hungry she does not need to feed but she's still going to try and catch something if the opportunity presents itself all these wildebeest after a traumatic crossing now faced with a lioness lurking in the grass now she's in prime position to have a go It's exactly correct, Lee. It's exactly what it's like. You say it's like surviving a car crash, but then being hit by a bus or being perhaps, um, I don't know, taken out in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Now here she spots another victim and it's almost half-hearted. Victim gets pinned against the termite mound and again, what you see is the lack of flexibility and also the exhaustion. What I want you to see is how tired this wildebeest is after the crossing. It can hardly run. So let's watch her here. Okay, so she, there she is. She's picked her victim. Look at that one <coughs> wonderful what stance she's taken. She flings around. And you can see the wildebeest can hardly move. It can't get out of the grass. It trips. And now it can't stand up. Its legs are too tired. It kind of flings itself around a bit, but it's very quickly over. And I remember watching that feeling, almost it was the first kill that I'd seen on the side of the river. And I remember feeling very kind of let down by it because there wasn't a huge fight from the wildebeest. It was so exhausted that it was unable to really put up a fight despite the fact that that lion was so enormously fat. Now, let's go back here. It would be remiss of me not to tell you two things about what we've just seen over there. The first is that that's evidence to me of how lions like to just hunt. They don't necessarily like to hunt and eat. And it feels to me like the instincts are distinct from each other. And when Fergus and I were in this region of the Salt Lake uh, in the year 20, uh, 2017, we watched in the course of 20 minutes, the lions kill eight wildebeest. Many of you would have seen it. They didn't eat one of them. So that's the one thing. The other thing to say as we sort of conclude our discussion on this migration is that there are about 7,000 predators in the Masai Mara Serengeti ecosystem, okay? They miss about 60% of the death that goes on during the migration. So 60% of the death that goes on during this vast migration, it's about 200,000 animals odd, depending on how many animals you calculate in total. 200,000 drop dead of exhaustion, disease, old age, various other causes that are not predation. And they miss those animals entirely. Those disappear down, or well, some of them get eaten, some of them get scavenged, but a lot of them just become part of the soil. And for me, the greatest kind of, um, the greatest fact or the greatest, uh, piece of, what should we say, um, the greatest take out from that 
is that when our human ancestors came onto these plains, there was a massive amount of food for them to eat because nothing was eating it. So many die of entirely natural causes outside of those of predation. Okay, let's go back to South Africa, where Lauren is trying desperately to keep up with the little chief who does like his exercise in the evening. Oh dear, oh dear, Hasana here is well and truly having us wandering, well, driving as he is wandering off into thickets. Actually, I think, there we go. He is there, we've still got him, don't worry, but there is other vehicles around as well, which makes it a little bit tricky to keep up with them. I can try and edge forward, said. Oh wait, I'm rolling, I'm rolling. Yeah, oh, he's walking fast. <sighs> he's off. Alrighty, Hasana's really not making it easy for us today. Have you got him, Seb? No. Yeah, he's off right into the thicket here. And I've just stole the car. Rusty, the car does sort of, uh, it's not having a, a very good week. So I'm just going to wait for a while before I turn it on. So of course, not just once twice or thrice this week, we got to spend time with Hosanna and his lovely female impala up a tree. Ever feel like you are being watched? Hosanna definitely did with heart lurking below him. He is currently not winning any favours with the hyenas this week. From stealing their kills to teasing them with food just out of reach, Hosanna has really plucked up his courage and no longer shares his food. Like dangling a carrot in front of a donkey's nose, he taunted Hart, repositioning his kill several times, as if at any moment he may drop it. So for the time being, we're not going anywhere. We may have to get Conrad and Marcel to come, just in case you guys are listening. I will attempt to start this car, but as far as we go, it's not going anywhere. Hosanna, on the other hand, is going somewhere, and I think he's heading to Ingwe Alley, which is great that Ingwe means leopard and is finally actually living up to his namesake. For the whole time I have been here, I never, ever saw an Ingwe on Ingwe Alley. So we are not going anywhere, but David is. Over to him. Well, very good. What we have decided to do, our lions have uh, remained flat and flat. They did not move. But what is interesting, I think, over the dinner table today, uh, me and James will have everybody keeping quiet and listening to our story of that particular lioness of a tamarind mount down because that was quite hilarious. And maybe we're going to share that uh, with James and uh, John Dree and Steph, who are all in the camp, and uh, Alex and Martin, and Martin and Alex are in the tech department, and I'm sure you all know Steph and, uh, of course, uh, the other two gentlemen, finding out what might have happened there, because we are yet to know how those, or how that particular lioness ended up just falling over on its own, you know, not being pushed by anybody. There were two of them, and, of course, the other one that we saw down there. So we slowly want to head back home and maybe chance on anything else uh, we might see on the way. And remember earlier, for those of you who did not hear me, I say tomorrow I am going back to my second home. Of course, my second home is the Mara. The Mara itself is vast, it's huge, but there's one particular corner I love that they call the Sausage Republic. I can't remember what other name I gave it. Oh, is it the Sausage State, I think? I give it the Sausage State, yes, the Sausage State, because I'll be going to look for my lovely and very popular uh, lions that we all know, the sausages. That James have not seen them, I guess, since he got here. Uh, James, do you want to have a look at those buffaloes there, please? It's quite a big herd of buffaloes. And they're not very far from where the Oloros are. And should they think of getting some early dinner? Initially, they were looking at the toppy. And I think, you know, the youngsters changed their mind. Not very good hunters. They thought, ah, just forget it. Too small. Maybe burn so much kilocalories and maybe not catch anything. 
It's a big herd of buffalo here. And is a big herd, males, females, youngsters, to school off, and it's time for them to keep eating. Well, we'll keep moving forward because you never know what you might see on the way as we leave uh, these buffaloes and we'll take you back right to the studio, to James. Righty, I just wanted to correct something before I show you the final clip that I voiced. This, uh, remember I said it was 2,500 kilometers all in all, probably outside maximum, it's half that. I misremembered, it's not actually from 900 k's from there to the top, it's only 400 kilometers from the southern plains up through the western coral rule, the Grumeti Game Reserve, and into the Masai Mara. So it's a round trip only of about 1,250 kilometers or so. Just wanted to tell you that in case you went home thinking that I had lied to you. Now, the North Clan of Hyena, our favorite clan in the world, has moved home. When we were last here in the Masi Mara, they lived, ooh, let's say they lived around about here with these, I've put these two lines. They were over there, and Waffles saw the demise of her matriarchy over there, and they have now moved to a new den over here, and we have spent two beautiful evenings with them. Finally, we made it to the new North Clan den. There are so many cubs that it's really quite tough to tell what's going on. That said, Waffles remains with the clan, and her cubs, Ilovo and Grenadine, are doing very well. Anthropomorphically speaking, she seems content in the hierarchy, ranking around fourth behind Soup and her cubs, Lobster and Chow. So very difficult to tell what on earth is going on at that den, especially when it turns dark. But we spent another extended period with them last night. The two biggest cubs at the den are definitely Waffleses. They're showing quite a lot of dominance behavior over some of the others, but I've yet to see Soup, the new matriarch of the clan, and I've yet to see her cubs, which in theory should be dominant over Waffles and hers. So apparently, and this is what the hyena researchers tell us, Soup is definitely still the matriarch, and her daughters, are they both daughters? No, one's a daughter, one's a son. Lobster and Chow are more dominant than Waffles, and she will actually show submission to them, despite the fact that she has fallen off her perch and she was so high-ranking at one stage. So, very interesting. She ranks around fourth and her cubs just under that. Now, this is very exciting news. Lauren has managed to, I think, incur yet another crown of the marshmallow. Not marshmallowed, not stuck, just our car won't start. Rusty has been rather under the weather lately and been in hospital. And we thought she was okay, but she's obviously not okay. So she needs a little bit of TLC. So I'm really sorry, everyone. We cannot follow Hosanna. I genuinely apologize for that. But I think we we got a good view of him. He, we know he's around. He's very close to the dam campan. So he may even appear there later on so I do apologize for that however we are stuck and Conrad I think is on his way to rescue us as he did Pat last night but I'm not marshmallowed so there's not much I can do from here but of course there is a moment that we can share with you a second precious moment of the two little cubbies that we had with the Inkahumas. One cub sighting just isn't enough we were spoiled with another precious sighting of the cutest cats on Juma. It's all fun and games for the little lion cubs. Especially when you can make your mum a play toy. First, a game of attack the tail. Then followed by a game of attack your sibling. So I believe our rescuers might be here. They have just arrived, which is fantastic news. So we will get out of here and we will get home for our dinner. So two precious moments with the Inca Huma Cups and hopefully a lot more to come in the future as they get a little bit older, a little bit stronger, and of course they are bouncing about. So as we get out of here with our help, 
We're going to send you guys across to Pat. <laughs> Bad luck, Lauren. Bad luck. Well, it makes me feel a little bit better knowing that I got marshmallowed last night, but, uh, well, I think that was my fault. <laughs> this one seems completely out of Lauren's control. Now, I was looking around kind of Twin Dams area, Mawati River, because there was a few vultures around, a fair few actually, which made me think that they may be a kill. Tandy was around there today, and so perhaps they, she had a kill somewhere around there. But I was searching and searching and searching without any luck. And now that we only have a couple... Oh, is this a... I think that might be a bush baby. Do you think we'd be able to reach that, Craig? Hmm. Nah, it's a bit far. Uh, so, yeah, now I... Oh, I got one minute. One minute to find something. That, that bush baby would have been very difficult to have gotten on the infrared camera. So, it's on. Again, last minute animal. Can we do it? Forty seconds. Ah, ah. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it with thirty seconds to go. Uh, I don't think I'm going <laughs> to make it. So it is time to say farewell for our final ever safari lives. Thank you all for joining us through these fifty-six epic, epic weeks. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have here. But as for now, it is time to sign off and say goodnight. Thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you in the morning for our AM drive.